I guess the thing that I want to start with, or the idea that I want to start with, is the following. Um, it, it was already clear to uh, people in the 1960s, for instance, uh, Max Matthews, um, long before any of this actually became possible, that the interesting thing, well, let me put it another way, the, the bad thing about uh, computer technology and, uh, as a tool for realizing music in the 1960s was the fact that it didn't operate in real time. Um, and uh, of course, Max Matthews knew this perfectly well, and he, he wrote he wrote a lot about dif uh, different roles that he thought computers could play in music performance over, over the years of the future. It's, it's fun to go back and see how prescient he actually was in his early writings. And um, Max himself was a violinist, amateur violinist, a pretty good amateur violinist, although he was quite self-deprecating about his playing. And um, uh, he, his, his interest in music was as an amateur musician. Uh, and in fact, he even went so far as to say that, uh, his, that an interesting thing to do with computers was to make things that would be appealing to amateur musicians as opposed to professional musicians, which was absolutely not the attitude that most computer music researchers would have had in the United States in, uh, in those years. But, uh, computer music was a thing that lived in, in centers that had very expensive equipment and that therefore were only uh, open to people who had uh, passed all sorts of, of tests and, and gone through all sorts of barriers in order to be able to get there. And those people had already been filtered so thoroughly that every ounce of creativity had been squeezed <laughs> out. <laughs> um, I was one of these people. <laughs> um, and I feel <laughs> privileged to have, have actually gotten my hands on a computer. So. Uh, Besides Max Matthews' influences on me were uh, Harry Perko, my, my professor at MIT, um, who um, somehow dragged me out of my uh, promising field of mathematics, or my promise as a, as a mathematician, and, and got me interested in doing computer music instead, which was not a field of endeavor that you could have an academic career in in the first place at that time. Um, and uh, another influence was, uh, indirectly, was Pierre Boulez. The indirectness of the influence was that he ran the center that uh, I ended up finding my feet in, uh, IRCOM, but the directness of it was that his interest, as well as Barry's, was always in the idea of the computer as a thing that, uh, that is involved in the musical performance. Um, uh, but it was actually specifically Max's idea that, that you could think of the computer as, uh, as a thing that you played as an instrument. That, uh, that idea doesn't belong to me at all. That, that, that idea is a thing that has been there Although, um, since, since the development of, of electronic music, particularly in the, well, in, in the places where electronic music developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is to say the great radio studios of Europe, uh, the, the, the WDR in Germany and the, oh, I forget, I forget them all, but they're the GRM in France and so on like that. These, they, they were, they were composer-centric kinds of places. And in the U.S., um, it was somewhat different, but the uh, but the centers that, that rose both in both in universities like the Columbia Princeton Studio, which was uh, I think the first really uh, functioning electronic music studio in the United States, but also um, just to just look at its extreme opposite, there was a wonderful uh, center in San Francisco called the San Francisco Tate Music Center that had all, uh, Pauline Oliveros and Morton Sabotnik. These were people that were not welcome in universities at the time. Right. And um, uh, but they were all composers. If you ask them what they did, they, they would say they were composers. And so computer music became this composer-centric um, pursuit, and the pursuit of or the development of computer music tools became the development of, of things like C sound before real time became available, but also um, the the various tools that um, well uh, notation package things like. Um, Finale and now Sibelius, uh, but there were earlier ones as well. Um, and the DAWs, right, the things that, that give you a whole bunch of tracks that they pretend that they're in a, a multi-track tape studio of some sort or another. Right? And these are, are uh, these are tools for non-stage music production in some way or another. Um, or to make a more extreme statement, as David Zicarelli says, when you uh, when you're doing computer music. Um, you know, perhaps 5% of the time you're making music and 95% of the time you're doing office work. When you're, <laughs> when, you're sit, when you're sitting in front of your screen putting the notes down on uh, Sibelius or uh, messing with your multi-track thing, uh, twiddling some knob on, on some limiter or whatever it might be, that's office work, 
right? That's that, that's not actually directly making music. That is uh, that is preparing to make music, or um, or presenting the fact that you've made music. <laughs> but it's not actually making the music, which is this thing ha that happens between groups of people playing together or even people playing solo. Um, with um, with they, with their fingers and, and, and their mouths usually, other parts of the body sometimes come into play. But as Max Matthew says, the, the the fastest bit rates that you can get out of the humans are, are the fingers and the articulators in your mouth. So those are the things that people usually use to, to apply themselves to a music lesson. And then there's this this uh, intuition, this intuitive knowledge that we have about how to make music come out, which most people have, uh, even people without musical training can, can sing. Sing to their babies, right? So, so singing is a, is a is a thing that's much much older than computer music, right? And uh, and so people have this intuitive notion of what a musical phrase is in time, or what a musical object is in time, that uh, actually isn't very easily replicable by typing commands into a computer. And in fact, one could argue that the entire process of learning how to compose, if you if you if you study composition formally. That process is is, um, is finding ways of representing on paper things that you already probably knew in your head or in, or in, in your embodied instrument playing, assuming you play an instrument, and uh, which really didn't fit on the piece of paper at all, except that some people, starting with Guido von Rossum or someone like that, you know, started uh, started inventing this idea that you could put these blots of ink on a piece of paper as a as a as a, as a way of uh, first helping you remember what you wanted to do so that you can do it again. And second, so that the Pope can send the same stuff out to all the churches so that they won't accidentally sing the wrong hymn and wake up the wrong God and call thunder down on their church. Well, so music, so the written music is, of course, uh, a form of, of religious control as well as, uh, as well as a, 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 wow, a, a way of, of trying to organize musical thought. It's very powerful. And, and since it's a powerful tool, it's actually a good thing that you composers like you are, are taught to do this, this um, sacrilegious stuff. Uh, a religious thing of, of, of putting notes down on this piece of paper instead of just making music, which is the thing which you do with your bodies in real time, uh, outside of the influence of any computer at all. Well, well, it follows that um, that all of that work on all that work that happened before the real time era of computer music was essentially in preparation for what became possible, which was to use computers in real time. And all that office work is, of course, still doable. Uh, computers are good at enabling office work. But uh, in some ways, that's beside the point. And you can also regard things like C sound as, as predecessors. Uh, um, this is not really strictly true, because C sound now is a real-time thing as well. But you can regard the, the non-real-time music in sequence of languages as, as sort of predecessors for what is, is possible now which is to get a computer to, to be involved in real time with, with, real, uh, with real musical performance. So, uh, part, so the purpose of, of this talk is to try to develop that, that uh, chain of thought and to examine what sorts of, of, um, what sorts of, of um, influence that that way of thinking might have on, on the developer of a, of a piece of computer music software. Uh, in particular, when you watch people use something like Max or PD or Super Collider or something like that, they are, um, there's, a, there's an interesting spectrum of, of, of usage patterns that you see. Uh, on one end, if, I, if you like, of the spectrum is the idea that you treat the computer as a separate performer, a separate uh, entity that, that itself makes time, makes musical time happen. Uh, and, and a simple example of that is, well, you just code up some loops, right? And, and then you set the computer off doing the loops, and you turn them on and off, or something like that, like a conductor maybe. And meanwhile, the computer is sitting there uh, having all the fun, or having what would have been fun if a computer could have fun, which is actually, which is actually making the sound. Right? Okay, so that's the uh, that's the idea that you you are actually cutting yourself off from the music making and, and ordering the computer to make the music for you. Right? Um, or, and on the other end of, of this spectrum that I'm trying to describe is the idea that you would insist that the computer itself be a thing which, um, uh, be a thing whose, whose, whose output reflects uh, only the immediacy of what you're actually doing to it right now. Um, and, that's, uh, and that is trying to ask the computer to be a musical instrument. And that's not, um, 
And that's not to say that when you take your hands off the computer, it has to instantly fall silent. Because if, if, you, if you just proceed by analogy again, musical instruments resonate. So when you start the thing vibrating, it has a natural way of, of, of continuing to vibrate after you quit putting energy into the thing. But it's, all, but it's always true of a real musical instrument that the energy that you put in to it is the only thing that permits it to emit energy. That's, a, that's an oversimplification, but I'll, I'll go with it for a moment. So a vibraphone, for instance, you whack a vibraphone, it can, it can be still sounding many seconds after you quit whacking it as long as you've got your foot down. But, um, uh, but it can't possibly be true that the total acoustic energy that comes out of the thing uh, exceeds the amount of energy that you put into it, because, because then you would be you know, violating conservation of energy and the universe would blow up. It would be bad, right? we think. Um, and um, so, but, uh, right, so, so what happens is you put energy into the, into the instrument and then over the instrument's own sort of reaction time, it takes a, actually a rather small portion of that energy and turns it into, into acoustical sound, and then you get to hear it. Okay, um, and then, uh, right, and you put more energy in and, and the thing sometimes makes a louder sound. Right? In other words, you like, you like the fact, or one likes the fact that um, if you whack the thing twice as hard, out comes not twice as, you know, not twice the signal, but in some ways a bigger signal. And, the, and of course the way something, a real instrument reacts to an increase in intensity is something very complicated, but the human ear um, responds to that very, very quickly. The, the human ear can hear the, the effort that's being played, and, uh, that's being put into playing a musical instrument in some way. And that's true not just of, of external instruments that you whack or, or stroke or, or blow into, but also your own voice. You can, you can hear whether someone's putting effort into putting a, putting a sound out or, or not. And it's not like you want them to put effort out, but you want to hear that rise and fall of effort because that's part of the musical shape that that's happening. And if the musical instrument is going to sit there playing a loop or something like that, then it's not doing that. And therefore, it is making you think its way up and down some kind of musical slope rather than simply generate it yourself musically. Okay, so um, this is opinion, or rather, there's, a, there's an implied opinion behind all this, which is that I think that that's actually a, a, a better and, and more interesting way of making music to, to treat the computer as a musical instrument than it is to treat it as a, as a separate musician. And there are people who would disagree with me about this. And that's not a problem. You can, you can find them all over the place, and they can tell you their opinions, too. Or you can have that opinion, and then you can argue with me, which would be fine. Um, because there's no truth value to any of this, right? You could, you, if I were giving give you a math equation, then it would be true or false, right? But if I tell you something about music, there actually aren't any facts at all about music, except when some composer died or something like that. But the actual music, there's nothing factual you can say about it it's music. <laughs> it's, no one even knows what it is. <laughs> um, and they try to define it, and the results are always laughable. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do now is, is just take you through some examples, the first of which is, a, um, uh, is an old one. It's, uh, it's Piton by Philippe Mannery, um, which is a piece for piano and electronics. And my reason for um, playing you this, or playing an extract of this uh, is to try to show you that, um, well, to try to, to use that as a frame for, for, uh, for, for, for explaining what the situation was when, uh, when I first came up with Max and why, what sorts of things I was trying to make possible. Um, I should say, well, I'll say that later. Uh, so let's let's just grab some of it, and so I have uh, I've just grabbed some extract of Piton to play for you, and since I don't know about sound, I'm going to use this in. played by Umo Ranta, this is the official recording. Sorry, I'm going to stop. 
stop it, and I'm going to tell you what you're listening to, and then restart it. So that was only about 30 seconds. It's okay to hear it twice. So, so what you should have heard is piano and then electronic sounds. The electronic sounds are clearly distinguished from the piano because they are pure sinusoids. They're about the least pianistic sounds you could possibly make. You know, that's <laughs> I could think of less pianistic sounds yet, but all right, they're they're not pianistic. Um, and and yet I hope you hear some kind of correspondence or some kind of attachment of, of, the, of the sounds of the sinusoids to, to those of the piano. <coughs> which, is, which is not that the sinusoids are imitating the piano, but that they are following the piano in a, in a, very, in a very audible way, in an in a intimate way, in fact. What's happening um, is that the, I have to tell you this on two levels, what's, um, what's happening on, on the high level, on the high no-nothing no level, the level of the airplane that's so high that you can't see anything at all, uh, what's happening at that level is that um, the piano is driving the sounds of the oscillators in a way that, um, in such a way that the oscillators rise and fall with the sound of the piano, but also adjust their timbre uh, with the piano's timbre, in such a way that it sounds in some way like the oscillators belong to the piano, or, or appendages to the piano. It, and you all probably know this because everyone tries this at some point. Take an empty beer can and just put it in the piano play along and everyone's like go wham and the, and the can starts moving and you hear that well this is that except it's that uh, much more expensively and with sinusoids instead of a can mm -hmm. and with oh, okay now I'll now I'll drop down into detail so the, the pitches of the sinusoids are composed so there are, are up to 48 of them at any one time and they uh, those pitches are being chosen by the composer by Philippe Mattery and uh, so what he has written in the score is a piano part on a couple of staves and then oscillators on a whole bunch of other staves sitting above the piano staves uh, that, uh, that start and stop at particular points in the score. But the score itself doesn't actually show how the, the sine waves come in and out in amplitude because that is being controlled in real time by the, uh, uh, by the patch that, that realizes the piece. Okay. And having told you that, I should start it again. And then I'll let it go on a little bit more, and then I'll then I'll show you where Philippe then gets uh, trigger happy and starts uh, just letting the computer start generating sequences. Okay. Nothing's happening yet. That's just reverb. I've come to the sinus. <laughs> So we're not going to do that. Um, what you heard then was uh, was kind of the opposite of what I'm what I'm trying to privilege, which is um, uh, which is an automaton actually realizing a Markov chain, which is being trained by the piano. So there, the idea, and this is a this is a trope that, that has stuck with us in, in electronic music um, performance for since well before this piece and, and, and exists still to this day. The idea that you uh, that you have the computer. Uh, Picking up ideas from the performer, and then generating its own sequences, which uh, which are in some way a transformation of what the what the performer has, has played, but independently of the performer. So I played that segment so that you could sort of hear the contrast between the, that that sinusoidal sound in which the the, the 
uh, balance of the sinusoids is being changed constantly as a, as a function of the piano playing in a way that sounds like temporal variation, right? And then what you heard later was setting off this kind of machine that eventually is able to run independently of the piano altogether. So you actually heard the machine running even after the piano is shut up, which is, uh, which is kind of the opposite of using the energy of the piano as, as the driver. Okay. Um, just, um, just to tell you a little bit of history here, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give myself a moment to do this. Um, this is the uh, this was the first Max piece. Uh, this was the second piece that Philippe Mannery and I did together. Uh, it was uh, premiered in 1988, and it uh, the first piece that he and I did together was Jupiter for flute and electronics. Uh, both uh, each each of these pieces in turn. Um, uh, represented pretty large technological advances in our ability to make real-time electronic music, uh, I think. But of course, I was part of it, so I, everyone thinks that they're making advances, so it's for someone else to judge whether that was really an advance. Uh, in both cases, the, uh, the setup of, of, of the music required that the live player, the flutist or the pianist, uh, depending on the piece, actually be in control of, of the advancement in time through the entire piece, so that the player didn't have to follow uh, click track or a tape part, but actually had control over the tempi of, of, of the piece. And that was uh, that was a, a huge liberation that, that uh, performers uh, both liked and hated uh, for, for reasons that we could go into if you want. Um, and uh, the production of Jupiter, which, uh, which was uh, premiered in 87, took two years. Uh, because at IRCOM at the time, every single piece of real-time uh, electronic music required a software project because if you wanted to make a computer do something, you had to have a program that made the computer do something. And so we wrote a computer, we, meaning the IRCOM technical teams, would write a new computer program for every single piece of music that was produced at IRCOM. There was surprisingly, or not surprisingly, little, little music coming out of IRCOM um, <laughs> during those hard years. Meanwhile, uh, other things were happening, like the Pino de Junio was developed in the 4X, which was the, uh, which was the processor which made the sound uh, that these pieces uh, Laid on the, <coughs> made the the electronic sounds for these pieces, right? And that was a huge hardware project that um, that absorbed um, several people in Aircom for for about a decade. Um, so it wasn't just that we were trying to write software. There was a lot of other stuff that had to come together too. But on a software level, um, uh, Jupiter was one of those pieces where, oh, you want to make a piece of computer music? Well, here's the 4x. All you have to do is program it out will come up with a nice piece of music. And so you hire a programmer for two years, roughly, and out comes a working program that, that realizes a piece of music. Right? This is what we call unsustainable <laughs> in modern language. I don't think that word had really been come into use at that point. Um, but at any rate, um, Jupiter was a success, and so they invited Philippe and me to work together on another piece. And uh, at that point, I realized what was going on. <laughs> and decided to try to uh, make a setup where software would be reusable from one piece of music to another. And, um, and so I wrote Max, which is basically a way of hooking together pieces of C code um, that originally you just had to write afresh for every piece of music, but, uh, but it was a way of organizing the code so that you could take the pieces of code and put them together in different orders make your own programs without having to rewrite the C code itself and simply rewrite the organization of, of the code in, in the larger sense. And that, in my way of thinking, was uh, was what uh, the Max program did. Uh, it did one other thing, which is it um, had a real-time scheduler that was able to respond in, in real time to incoming events and make decisions in, in a way that could advance logically in a way that was specified by a composer. Um, those, the, uh, those were the two problems, basically, that I think uh, Max solved in a, in a usable way. Yeah. You asked to jump, so I will uh, first do yeah. jump. I'm very curious about why the, the performer did like or didn't like the control you gave them. You just yeah. Uh, yeah. The what was the, is, what were those reactions? It felt fun. So imagine you've trained for 20 years in a conservatory. And then someone gives you a piano, and you hit a key, and, it, and the sound comes out of the speaker that wasn't the sound that you hit on the key. <laughs> and if you hit the wrong key, it doesn't happen. <laughs> that was a kind of scrutiny, a kind of, of um, it made them feel watched. 
in a way. <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't make any sense as I'm saying it, because of course they're being watched. There are thousands of people in the audience. But it's different to be watched by a computer. You're being surveilled. <laughs> and it, it felt like surveillance. And uh, it took getting used to. It takes getting used to. Yeah, so it's, it's a different experience for a performer to have to deal with that. And did you use only machine listening like this, or did you use like pedal or contraption forward, going forward? Oh, boy. Well, uh, in Jupiter, in the case of Jupiter, which is the first one, uh, we didn't know what we were doing, right? So, um, flutist, uh, there are lots of detail, details about this. Um, the flutist is playing a special flute. It's got switches on all the keys. Mm -hmm. And um, the 4X and its controlling computer, among other things, is trying to detect the pitch of the flute. And therefore, uh, and wait for specific pitches to happen in order to, to make specific reactions. But of course, the flutist might miss the note, or the pitch tracker might misreport the note in some way, or the flutist might just use a fingering that that we hadn't known about before. <laughs> in which case, the computer wouldn't know what pitch was coming out at all, right? And that would be a bad thing. And and then the computer would just sit there and do nothing. And then the flutist would see that, would see or hear, actually see, because the poor flutist had this CRT with a big green number, which is where the computer was. And if and the flutist's job was if that didn't happen, the flutist would whack a pedal to save the, the, the situation. We realized that that was the wrong person to have do that job. <laughs> that flutist had plenty of work to do already, and that, uh, in fact, it was a better idea to have the computer operator safely out of sight <laughs> stabbing the keyboard when, when something uh, froze, right? <laughs> um, but at any rate, that's, uh, yeah, so so the flutist did have a pedal in, in, in the first instance of Jupiter, but later on we learned that we needed to take the pedal away, and, and did. Uh, and, and in the case of Tuton, uh, the score following was more robust, and we also had already figured out that a uh, pianist already has their feet busy with the three pedals, so you cannot ask them reliably to get over to a fourth pedal to save the computer. So at that point, it was clearly another question. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and on about this, but I <laughs> would be happy to. I could show you the patch and all that kind of stuff. But in fact, what I really want to do is, is move forward and show you other stuff that um, uh, that, that happened instead. Um, by the way, um, the whole you know, part of the job of a, of a software developer or, or of an instrument builder in general is to try not to build the aesthetics of the music that they have, that they think you should play into the instrument. This is a very complicated situ uh, thing to think about. So it should not be the case, for instance, that a violin privileges one musical scale over another, or that it, it doesn't, as far as I can tell. Of course, it has a tessitura, it has limitations, but on the other hand, it doesn't, a violin doesn't tell you that you can't play B flat after you play F sharp or something like that. It just does whatever you do on it. And that, uh, and that therefore, uh, allows a composer to project, or a performer even, to, to project a musical idea onto the thing without the thing itself being too much um, controlled by the nature of the instrument that they're playing on. And this is a thing which computer software developers like me worry about day and night, is how to make it so that computers don't uh, impose uh, the software designer's idea about what music should be upon the person who's trying to use the software to make music. And uh, so part of the, uh, part of what I was trying to do uh, in, in designing Max was to make it so that not only would Philippe be able to write Pluton with the thing, but other composers at Aircon would be able to write other kinds of music that would sound radically different from what Philippe was doing. As we see what really happened, everything that came out of Earcom sounded like it came out of Earcom anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> as soon as Max got outside of Earcom, because it fit on a diskette, it turned out to be a very, <laughs> physically very portable. This is pre-network, right? But it, it got all over the place, because David Wessel would just give people diskettes as he traveled the world uh, doing talks. And so people just had Max everywhere very, very quickly. And um, it wasn't copy protected or anything. And then, um, uh, and then people started using it for what they thought they wanted to, to, to get used at. And of course, the very first thing you do 
Metro random make note note out, right? That's, yes. that's, the, that's the max patch you all start with, right? And, uh, and you heard a lot of that stuff going on all over the world real fast. <laughs> so, it, um, so it's a really interesting question to me now. Was I actually leading people on in some way by, by making there be a metro object in the first place? I mean, if, you, if you look at how Philippe used the metro object, you won't, you won't find that kind of stuff at all. It's totally different. Um, but and much more work, uh, but the, but there certainly is an easy thing that you can do with Max, which is yeah, whatever I just said, Metro random make no good out, and um, and everyone does it, and so you you open the door on some practice studio and you know in, in some teaching school anywhere in the world, and, and you'll hear that thing. you'll hear that sound coming out of the synthetic piano that's that's program change number one on the synth. That's, that's that's the first thing you get, and um, so I I actually uh, sp have spent a lot of time thinking about you know I can't I can't unthink back so I can't turn my brain into one that would be able to invent some kind of some new kind of software paradigm that's radically different than that but someone else could what are the things that that, that the design of Max is imposing or imposes on uh, on you the user or even me the user. Uh, that aren't intended by the creator of Max at all, but in fact are just sort of facts about the, the program that um, that some other computer program might not have to impose at all. And this, in fact, it's rather extreme, or it was an extreme idea to, to create a, a program. And here, this is pure data, but it's the same. Um, this is it's the, it's the same way in this respect. Um, you know, when you say make a new document, you get nothing. You just get a white screen. In fact, in pure data you get even less than you get in Max, because Max you get a lot of toys right off. But, um, but in pure data you really just have to go think before you can even start doing anything at all, right? And um, that to me is very important. Um, that to me is, 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 is a gesture that I make to try to, um, to, try to prevent people from being led down some kind of garden path by pure data and the things that it happens to guide you into doing as a, as a pure data user or as a programmer using pure data. And, and then, you, then you have to step back and say, well, that looks like nothing, right? <laughs> but then when you think about it, there's, it's not nothing at all. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, it's the assumption that a blank piece of paper is a suitable um, is a suitable way to start make, uh, realizing a piece of, of, of music, right? If you were a violin builder, a blank, blank piece of paper would be useless to you because there's no way that you can actually use a piece of paper in constructing a violin that I'm aware of. Although I've never made a violin, so I can't really tell you that for sure. But it sounds believable that actually the blank piece of paper is in fact already sort of telling you to be a composer <laughs> instead of telling you to be a violin maker, <laughs> right? Um, also, um, even perhaps deeper than that um, is the way time works. Uh, and here, so time is passing as, as you're watching nothing happen on the screen, right? And what does what what does that mean? Well, part of what that means is that you're, uh, as David David Zicrelli says, it's time to sit down and do some office work, right? So, so there's a built-in assumption that before you're even going to make anything come out of the thing, you're going to have to make some middle structures that um, that uh, will describe the, the, the class of sound that you're going to that you're going to enable the computer to make with the program that you're going to make using the max or pure data, and that um, that is a very earcom kind of a thought. Um, uh, I didn't think about it as an earcom kind of, kind of a thought when my entire world consisted of earcom, but now that you think about it. That's a lot different from walking into a room that has a bunch of pieces of wood and a saw and some glue and stuff, right? And a hammer. And oh, let's make. Uh, well, why don't you make some music? Well, <laughs> then you would do something radically different than what you would do to try to make music with this. And so there is a very strong um, technical, sort of cultural uh, statement being made here um, that maybe partly is kind of hard to escape simply from the fact that we're on a computer. And so you could just criticize the fact that we're using a computer at all, maybe. Or you could also say, well, I didn't fight hard enough, right? Or I didn't find all the possible ways that you could fight against the, the channeling of the computer itself into you, as, of you into an office worker. In, 
computers, you know, were, were, were designed basically over the lifetimes of, I mean, over history. The, the applications that computers were mostly designed for were military and financial, right? I mean, they were, very, they were good for um, computing missile trajectories or shell trajectories, like if you want to shoot another boat but the wind was blowing and blah, 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 then you needed a computer, right? And then the other thing that you needed a computer for was as soon as your bank got big enough that it was, that the numbers got too complicated, you needed a computer to automatically crunch the numbers. So computers are really good at making decisions, not decisions, computing uh, things about, uh, about how to pay people or how to kill people. Uh, it, it doesn't follow necessarily that this is a good starting point for making for making the musical instrument. On the other hand, of course, uh, speaking as a mathematician, uh, I can tell you that oh, computers are good at carrying out mathematical instructions. And if you wanted to have the most powerful possible musical instrument that you could possibly imagine, you would just start with pure mathematics because you would just imagine you would just imagine the sound and imagine its properties, and then make something mathematical that that would cause those properties to come into being, as if you could write new equations in physics or something like that. And that would, that would even free you from, from how the real world acts. For instance, in, in computer land, you can make instruments that don't obey conservation of energy. There's no reason you have to conserve energy when you're just making equations. So you can do things that you make a small gesture and you get out a very loud noise, but you make a real harsh gesture and it shuts up. That kind of thing. And that might be a fun thing to try to do. That, that, would, that would kind of negate what I just told you a musical instrument ought to act like. And, seek ways of negating what I'm telling you because what I'm telling you is just what I think and if everyone thought the same way then everyone's music would sound the same that would be bad, we think alright, and time is passing and I have to get down to brass tacks here so um, so I'm just going to leave those gen general thoughts with you as you now watch me try to make things happen that feel like like the sort of reactivity that, that computers do make possible but is, but is still very hard to get computers to really do uh, for, for various reasons. Okay, so I, at this point I'm going to break my usual custom. Uh, usually everything that I do is just trying to do things on a computer, but I'm going to actually call up a movie and, um, to show you something more recent. This is a performance by Spectacles. Ah, there they are. I can't see my screen. Okay. Um, this, uh, this is going to be a movie. Oops, what's volume. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about output volume now. Uh, I think what I need to do. Is this main control if you need it? I don't actually believe that control is changing anything. <laughs> I think so. I'm going to do this first. And then I'm going to start the movie because I'm not sure where the volume control is on my little movie player. I don't do this very often. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So now I'm going to try to find the movie. Start. Do I have the movie? Yeah, I got the movie. So now I'm going to say, M. No. Bad things might happen, but good things might happen instead. Get this going. We have sound. All right, very good. This is too good to be true. All right. Now I'm going to go back here. This is Juliana Snapper um, performing in Shanghai, a piece that she and I developed together called Teratoma. And watch her play the computer, I guess is what I, what I want you to do.
Sorry, I'm going to stop her because this also goes on for a while. Um, so she's playing a uh, she's playing a beer can, <laughs> or she's playing a computer with a beer can, and also with her voice. Um, increasingly, this goes on. Um, and I'm going to attempt to show you that. Um, come on. It's called Teratoma. Let's see, I'm gonna uh, I need to do something here. All right. Bits of little bits of success already. So I'm gonna say turn on step. Yeah, there we go. Exactly the same gesture, exactly the same thing will come out. However, um, it is the case that whatever happens will be driven by the gesture that I make in such a way that you can clearly feel the causality and feel the aspects of the sound that feel that there are aspects of the sound that I'm controlling even without being able to know denotatively what the mapping is between what I do and what comes out. Um, a lot of people make a whole bunch of, of um, emphasis on this idea of mapping things as, as ways of helping the audience understand what's going on with the form of the forms. And in fact, I think that's kind of nonsense that uh, it's best to leave things a little mysterious because in fact, if you watch a violinist or a pianist or a singer especially, how what they do turns into sound is basically completely mysterious to the audience anyway. So there's no need, there's no need to avoid that possibility. Um, what's happening here is um, the Harmony of, of what's going on is being um, chosen by the computer, not not dictated by the sound at all. And what the sound is doing is controlling the timbre of what's coming out, a little bit similarly to what the piano was doing in, in Philippe Manoury's piece of the But in this case, um, in a much more direct way, the, the computer simply has a bunch of filters, um, very very uh, tuned filters that that resonate for a long time. And whenever you um, make a new attack, it tunes the filters to a spectrum that's chosen according to an algorithm, but in fact there's a good deal of just uh, randomness in it. And, uh, and there are generating pitches, of course, which are specified, which are part of the score. And then the sound goes into the filters and sets them ringing, but if you do that with a whole bunch of filters, then this, the spectrum of the sound uh, controls which of the filters get tickled and which of them don't. And therefore, this, this, the timbre of what comes out uh, is a direct, um, the direct consequence of, of the sound that you've triggered it with. So what's happening here is almost, uh, it's almost like you um, you had a percussion instrument which you could strike or, or activate in some way, except that the percussion instrument itself was constantly changing in a programmatic way or in an algorithmic way. So the so the the, the flow of energy is clear to the to the viewer. Uh, and, and yet the mechanics or the, the details of what the instrument is, you know, is doing or not. And the fact that it reacts instantaneously uh, uh, helps you helps you attach, or actually helps the performer understand what's going on, and also helps you as a viewer understand what's going on. So, um, so, this has to, so if, if this were starting some kind of loop, say, then you would not have that same kind of intimacy of control over, over what comes out of the speakers. 
even though you don't actually really control what comes out of speeches at all, it's intimate in your mind. By which I mean, you don't control the specific choice of partials that it, that it chooses every time you make an attack, but you choose when the attacks are, and you choose the timbre of the attack that sets up the timbre of the response. Um, and I could show you how to do that if you want. It's, it's easy. You, you use bonk to detect the attacks, and you just set up a filter bank, and you give them just monstrously high Q values so that they uh, so that they resonate resonate for five or ten seconds, and then you just amplify the sound like crazy, and then feed it to the filters, and then they will ring with all with the pitches that you give them. And then you invent any algorithm you want to to select a good, beautiful sounding set of, of, of pitches to assign to them. Oh, and there are only like 16 of them. That's all, all it took. And, and the pitches are being chosen algorithmically, and I'll explain the algorithm someday if you care. But in Ventura, it's easy to invent algorithms to generate nice collections of pitches. And by the way, that goes completely against what I was saying about, <laughs> um, about uh, computers automating the, the production of music, because of course that's a form of automation. But on the other hand, it's not a form of automation that happens in time. It's a form of automation that happens instantaneously. It's a, it's a way of instantaneous choice making. In the same way, perhaps, as a piano string instantaneously chooses what happens when the hammer hits it. Well, if the string's not vibrating, then the same thing happens pretty much every time it starts vibrating. If you hit a, if there's a piano string that's vibrating, and then you hit it again with the hammer, then what happens depends on whether the, that part of the string is moving down or up as the hammer struck it. And that's why when you hit a repeated note on a piano, you hear this beautiful succession of different timbres. It's because the, the phase of the, of the wave that's set up on the string um, affects how the hammer affects it back. So it's instantaneous, and yet it's random. Well, sorry, it's instantaneous, and it's random, and yet it's, it feels natural. As a, as a and nobody minds the fact that every single attack sounds different, because your ears just like that. And, you know, go figure. But that's, that's, that's just the way people listen to pianos. And that's the way you can listen to a computer, too, I guess. The fourth sort of example of a computer <coughs> music instrument that, um, that I find interesting. And this is um, a thing that I made out of a Leap controller. Leap controller is this object that costs um, $80 or so in the US, and it's made for games. It turns out that people who design uh, computer games care a lot about uh, fast response times, because gamers are, especially professional gamers, are uh, people who um, people who compete with each other as to, how, as to how fast they can shoot each other or something like that. And as a result, uh, very fast um, visual to hand reflexes are, are privileged in the computer games world. Right? So um, the Leap controller is a thing which runs at about 100 frames per second. And it's like a Kinect for your hand. So um, the Kinect is this Microsoft thing that you dance in front of. And the problem with dancing in front of stuff is that it takes you a long time to dance right? in, in musical terms. In other words, to get your arm from here to here takes what I mean, you can maybe get it done in about a fifth of a second, but in in terms of music, that's an eon. So uh, you need things that, that can move faster than that if you want to use them as musical controllers. And by the way, on that subject, uh, please don't point a camera at a dancer and have them dance and have that control sound because that cannot happen in musical time because dancers work in physical time, not musical time, and that's a different thing. Um, if you will, if you look at a very skilled in music player, an instrument player of any sort. Uh, you'll find that most of the motion is, is below the forearm and even below the wrist. Um, uh, even a violinist, the, the, the very fast stuff is, is done in the wrist. And um, as a result, just knowing where my elbow is is not going to help a computer music instrument um, uh, make musical time. So the, the Leap controller is actually a thing that is fast as opposed to the Kinect. Uh, oh, the Kinect itself is, you know, the original one ran at 30 frames a second. I assume the Kinect 2, which I haven't looked at, runs faster, but you're still basically hamstrung by the uh, slow response of the body itself. Um, and as I mentioned on Tuesday, Max Matthews used to say, yeah, the, the fast bandwidth that comes out of humans is coming out of your fingers and out of your mouth. And what I'm not going to do is show you how to make a vocal controlled instrument, but what I will show you how to do is at least one approach to making a hand controlled instrument. Um, and just to, just to puncture as many balloons as I can, um, there's, there's this great belief, especially around Stanford University, that everything ought to be haptic. Um, and haptic is good, but 
it might not be that making things that are robotically haptic is terribly important when you're trying to design a good computer in music interface. There might be particular kinds of computer music instruments where haptic, inter where haptic feedback is important, but I haven't seen one yet. And in fact, there is haptic feedback just built into your body, right? Because the truth is, when you move your hand somewhere, you feel where it is, and that's feedback. Um, and that's all there is to it. Uh, or, in, or also, if you distend something, you know, if you, if you, you know, if, if you push your fingers hard in one direction or another, you feel the force that your muscles are exerting to make that happen, and that's haptic feedback. So you've, you've got it. All you've got to do is use the, the stuff that's already there, and you can save yourself like twenty thousand dollars and also some serious danger because the, the haptic feedback things that try to um, make, uh, you know, force, you know, force dependent on, on on some program output, those things have large motors behind them. And then if the thing gets programmed wrong, the thing can just smash you in the face. <laughs> you don't want it. So just don't go there. And just enjoy the fact that you can play like a theremin just with, uh, just with your feeling of your own body and, and not the feeling of some thing that's, that's pushing back against you. So, uh, so from my point of view, uh, given those two things, the Leap controller is pretty ideal. And when this thing came up, therefore, I didn't buy one because I decided to wait and see if it was just another stupid thing that was overpromised. And a couple of years later, they went on sale. They, they were normally 80 and they went down to 60 and then I said, okay, 60 bucks, we'll do it. And then it sat in my drawer for a while. And then um, I started thinking about unstable oscillators in a completely different context and realized that um, here's, here's an interesting way to make an instrument. Um, if you're, you're all very lucky that you've never seen me try to play violin. There, there is an old picture of me playing violin that used to be on my website. That's a joke. I actually don't play violin. And uh, the interesting thing about not being able to play the violin is you can pick it up and make sound with it anyway, even though you can't play it. And the results are completely unpredictable. <laughs> because, well, not completely, but thoroughly unpredictable. It's, it always sounds like a violin somehow, but, it, but uh, you, you, know, you, you don't know what's going to happen when you actually draw the bow across the string if you don't know how to play one of the suckers. Some of you probably know how to play one, and then this doesn't apply to you. So, think, so imagine you're on a French horn instead. But, uh, but for me, violin is, is good, and, and, um, good and unplayable. And of course, that's also true for, or that was once true for every really good violinist. The truth is, probably you stick a three-year-old in front of a violin, you know, Suzuki method or whatever it's going to be, and, they're, um, and what's going to come out is going to sound exactly like what comes out of a violin when I try it. And, um, the violin itself is some kind of, of unstable thing, like the weather system, where uh, you know if you if you just do something robotically to it, it won't make a good sound. What you have to do is is, is invent some way of, of in your body train your nerves to be some kind of a feedback loop that somehow monitors both the feel and the sound of what's coming out of the instrument, and and uses a lot of memory in some some way that we don't understand. And eventually, you learn how to play this essentially um, chaotic system by essentially by riding it as if you were riding a horse somehow. At least that's my guess. Um, having never successfully played one, I can't really tell you that for sure. On the other hand, you can't ask a violinist because they can't tell you because the process is not conscious. Furthermore, you can't study the data stream from the human to the violin and understand the nature of that feedback loop because you can't actually access what the person is doing with what's coming back from the violin. <coughs> So that, you know, if you took a robot and taught the robot to make exactly the same gestures as a person made to play a violin, presumably the phase of the strings will be different, something will be different, and the, what will come out of the violin will be, you know, it'll, it'll squeak instead of playing the nice note. Right? At least I assume this is true. No one's ever been able to find out, because no one's ever been able to even do that, uh, you know, replicate perfectly the motions of a violin player. So we don't know. But, um, but anyway, my guess is that what's really happening is the violin is unstable and you are somehow making it behave by acquiring experience in this unstable system. So let's try making a computer music instrument that does the same kind of thing. So totally unstable system, therefore capable of interesting behavior. Um, but um, you don't know how to play it, but that's okay because first off, nobody else knows how to play it either. And second, you've got a controller that you can, um, suppose you just attach your hand to all the controls that the thing has and try to learn how to play it just by experience. right? So what you have is a sort of an analogy to what happens when you learn how to play a violin as a three-year-old. So the result should sound approximately like a three-year-old playing a violin, right? which maybe is not terribly interesting from a musical standpoint, but from a research standpoint, this seems to be extremely interesting. 
Right. So um, what I did was find, find a really unstable computer music instrument, and then I realized, yes, this is the time to take the lead controller out of the drawer and see what that does as a, as a way of playing this nice unstable instrument. Uh, the unstable instrument is, well, let's just play it a little bit. Um, if this works, you'll hear something. concert coming up in Limerick and, and I have the duet with Carrie Hagan where I play this thing and then she laptops it, which is to say she samples it and then gr grinds it up and throws it around and, and the result is pretty strange. Um, and very and you know what she what she what she makes out of it is going to be no better than what that thing is already. So you're, you're already working with something that's very sub violin, right? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, first off, what, what is the thing doing and why? So the first thing that I told you was you can't really do this in musical time, so it doesn't. It actually ignores completely where your hand is. And those of you who've tried to program a leap controller or seen someone else try to program a leap controller, the first thing that you think of is, oh, cool, X, Y, Z. Let's, uh, let's just make our, ourselves a nice three-dimensional joystick. And I submit that that's probably the wrong thing to do because uh, actually, it would be nice to have something that's invariant, so that you can just move move your hand as long as you obey, you know, as long as you keep the shape constant, and it won't uh, change the the sounds coming out of the speaker. So then you actually have this as a theatrical degree of freedom, because it's not actually changing the sound of the instrument, right? Almost like what you have when you're, you know, sort of doing this with a flute or something like that. Although not quite. Um, so what I ended up doing was deciding that the whole thing should actually be not only um, not only position independent but also attitude independent, with one exception, which is this. Um, uh, and I don't know why I decided to do this, but it seems to be good. Um, I'm using the uh, angle of the palm of your hand as the volume control. <laughs> that turns out to be a, a good thing to have. So now um, a thing is make a sound. And other than that, everything is, is is just the invariance of the hand itself. Can I ask for a favor? Yeah. Can you lower the reverb, please? Oh, I can I can cut the reverb altogether. It's true. It's too much reverb for this room. I haven't noticed. Um, zero. Oh yeah. Actually, that's much better. Circuit that oh. you play like this. This is your interface. Is, oh, I might have. Okay. If you, if you don't, I'll send you some videos. Although, yeah, the the person I would think of is David Tudor. In that, right? <laughs> Not the same generation. No, no, nor, no. Uh, same nor the same personality. I don't think. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think I've, I may have actually seen Blessed do this in the Nine Evenings last October in New York. I'm not sure if it was Blesser, but one of those one of those transistor in unstable circuit yes. feedback blah blah blah. Yeah. Perform. Yes. This is essentially that. Okay. Although it's a uh, it's a digital realization of that, and um, the 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 unstable system actually came out of a uh, a talk that I uh, did for the ICMC last whenever it was in, in Denton, Texas, 
where I started getting on this thing about how the sampling theorem was uh, hamstringing people's way of thinking about sound. And, um, and so as a, as a demonstration of something that you could do that, um, that basically broke all the rules of the sampling theorem, I decided to make a, uh, essentially a flow on a, on a uh, non-flat manifold. And you can do a lot. So actually, it's even locally flat, but, but imagine, a, imagine a piece of paper that you've somehow folded so that things can jump from one edge to another instantaneously. And so you're, and then just imagine going in a in a constant direction on such a piece of paper that wraps around, so that then where you come out the next time you go around might be different depending on whether you hit some crease or, or just got around the crease and therefore got a different path. And that's a that's a particular way of making um, something that has a wide variety of different possible um, oscillating frequencies because the paths through it depend uh, even it's the same flow. Uh, by flow, I just mean a bunch of. of Velocity associated with every point on the piece of paper. In fact, just a uniform flow, just just the wind blowing in one direction, right? But with but with certain places where you jump back, and that turns out to be very easy to compute and totally impossible to predict. In in and in, in fact, that's exactly what you're hearing. Here. And the three sounds that you're hearing, the three pitches that you're hearing. Maybe I can make three separate pitches. And, By the way, bad frame means I don't have my hand on there. Um, the, let's see, oh right, uh, piece of paper, I'm, I'm slightly oversimplifying. It's really uh, three-dimensional, so instead of, paper's two-dimensional, so it's really the interior of a shoebox shape with wormholes in it that cause you to jump to different places in it. So that if the wormholes aren't there, you just travel like a pool ball, like a billiards ball would if there were no gravity in it, the billiards table were a, a solid. And then you would just have three separate frequencies, the, the frequency this way, the frequency that way, and the frequency that way. But the fact that you put wormholes in it that the thing jumps across couples the frequencies and therefore makes it impossible. Well, unless you can make the wormholes small, which there's some way that I can do with my hand, but I can't find it right now. Um, you, uh, you don't get that at all. You get the fact that the three dimensions of motion are coupled to each other and therefore um, the whole thing operates in some sort of forced way. The other antecedent, by the way, is Buchla. Buchla's oscillator with the hard sync function, mm -hmm. right? So Buchla sold these synths that had oscillators that uh, you could synchronize one of them off of the other, which I believe means that the first one, whenever it went from negative to positive or positive to negative, it would bash the face of the other one to zero. But the other one, if it ever managed to change from positive to negative, perhaps it would go around and bash the first person's face back to zero, right? Or another physical analog would be this. Imagine two masses on, a, on springs. So mass on a spring is sort of what the acoustics, acoustics profs teach you to think about when you're thinking about oscillation. So you have a mass spring, wiggle back and forth, great. Take two masses and two springs, attach them to separate walls, and have them doing this, except every once in a while they whack each other, right, and bounce off each other. Then you, this one can't oscillate at its frequency because every once in a while it hits this one and, and vice versa. And then you get some sort of more complicated, unstable system that has some relationship to the two original frequencies, but also has some other quality, which is about how they're being coupled. So you can you can think in a lot of ways about this kind of situation. But the basic deal is oscillators, each of which is trying to trying to make the thing oscillate at its preferred frequency, but the two but the frequencies are different. So then you have a fight over it, and then you get sounds like that, <laughs> unpredictable sounds like that. Right? Um, and how does this work as a controller? Uh, so here's what the leak gives you. Oh, here's another thing. Here's another thing. Don't do. Um, don't take your leak controller and say, "Gee, I'm going to take the um, Z positions of my ten fingers, and those are going to be the amplitudes of ten harmonics, or the um, or the gains of ten uh, channels of a mixer." Say, that'd be kind of cool, right? You could have a mixer, and you could actually move all ten channels up and down at once. And the truth is, it is simply impossible to learn how to play that uh, because well, you just can't do it. And one thing that you can't do is move your fingers independently enough so that you can actually get a mix that you had in mind. <laughs> you can't get your hand to necessarily to get to that mix, and so you're just going to be frustrated. Right? The problem with your hand is that all these 
uh, all your joints are stuck to each other by bones, and bones have fixed length for the most part, hopefully. And when your bones are functioning right, uh, and therefore there are, are a huge number of, un, of incalculable or complicated, uh, incomputable kinds of constraints uh, uh, about where the various points of your hand can be. So the, the Leap controller uh, tells you in, uh, 100 times a second down to the millimeter where each of the 19 joints, well, there's a tip and, and three joints there, times five is eight, what's that, five by four is 20, why did I say 19? Well, there's only three bones here. But then there's one here, so that gets me up to, I, for some reason there's only 19 points here. Um, but, but it's not, and each one of them has three numbers associated with it, which is its position in space. But it is not the case that you have 57 independent things at all, because you can't just take the various ends of your bones and stick them in independent places in space. Nobody knows how to, how to, um, um, nobody knows how to characterize this, the shape of all possible things in 57 dimensions that you can get to with a reasonable hand gesture. Right? That's, a, that's computationally intractable. So what do you do? The, the last thing that you should do is treat those things as independent controls on some kind of synthesis algorithm, because then you'll get frustrated. Uh, as if you're not going to get frustrated anyway. Um, my, <laughs> my proposal of the moment is this. Um, imagine the hand as consisting of, um, as, as defining in space a sort of assemblage of, of architectural shapes, which are just triangles. So one of the triangles that you can imagine is wrist to first knuckle to first tip. And then you've got, um, roughly speaking, you've got two degrees of freedom that you can reasonably control, which is, um, if, this is an, uh, if this is the unit x-axis here, so x is, I don't know what, x is minus one and x is zero, and here's y, then here's a point in space that is roughly speaking, well, it's got a, an x, y range and a y range, and then it moves in a sort of blob shape, right? And that's, and that, and so there's a triangle there that, of which you have roughly two-dimensional control of its shape, which is interesting. There are many more degrees of freedom in a triangle, but that's roughly what you get with, with that particular one, I think. So do that to, to, to these three points, to these three points. Don't bother with this one because, um, you might have noticed that you cannot actually move all four fingers or five fingers independently of each other. That um, there's a thing. Well, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but you can't. Well, f first off, you can't actually take one of these things and lift it up this way. But if even if you could, you cannot do that and get these puppies to go down or something like that. Right. So um, a reasonable a, a reasonable amount of independence to ask for would be how about this finger and this finger. And the, let's just let these fingers just waggle around as, as, as they might and, and use these to get four parameters worth. And then another triangle is, this is a little unexpected maybe, from this thumb to this knuckle to this knuckle. And that is, uh, and we're pretending that this is the base of your thumb, although it's not. And, there, and therefore you get one more triangle uh, and, and, the, and the thumb therefore is making a blob relative to this vector here. And what you, what you do mathematically is you take this vector and this vector, and the two invariant things that you can do with those two is take their dot product, which is a measure of how far this extends further in this direction, and the cross product, which is a measure of how far it is up or down relative to this. So what you get here is uh, dot product and cross product, one, two, three, for the three triangles that I'm describing. And, there, and then you get a thing which allows you to take your fingers and let's just use one finger. And that should be changing just F1 and Z1 of them. Actually, I, yeah, I, I, I did break that app out just to see if the thing was working. And it's great, you make a shape and it sort of goes like that. <laughs> and I don't know what's, what, what the hysteresis is coming from, but... But there's a few, right? There's, some, there's ones that are more efficient than 
Uh, leaps, you mean, or apps? Uh, apps. With apps. Gesture. I don't know. Yeah, I guess I just tried the test app. Okay. And. Uh, Before we do buy it, it's a bit better. So. Okay. Cool. But I ended, I ended up just um, yeah. <laughs> just go, going straight for the C API, mm -hmm. and you can write this. They they give you a little test uh, C plus plus program with the developer kit, mm -hmm. and it just prints out everything mm -hmm. as fast as it can harvest it. But you can, um, but you can look at that code and pick out the bits you want. And then what I did was I just made a thing that just makes packet, network packets out of that and sends it on to PD. Yeah. So is an OSC send them. It's not OSC. It's FUDDY, which is the simpler OSC. Oh. FUDDY is just uh, take ASCII and make a network packet out of it and throw it away or throw it to whatever you want. Right. So for something that is local to the machine, you can throw it across the world. It's no problem. Yes, but OSC is complicated and FUDDY is simple. FUDDY is take a max message, which consists of numbers and symbols and a semicolon, network packet, send it. <laughs> and then PD has a thing called net receive that just sits there and waits for someone to send a PD message. And then that's it. Is that the same protocol as the net receive yeah. for max? Yeah. Is I, that oh, I don't know, actually. Max is made they a, expect an OSC as a, as a net receive still, that still works, I think, in current versions. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the same. So you oh, it prints out everything. Sorry? Oh, I see. The, the net receive in Max prints out everything. No, no, net receive is the external, it's not, a, it's not a native object. Which I think is probably from the probably same Probably it's the same thing. So, okay. yeah, I'm sure. It's, it's a protocol of Max. Right. Maybe that too. Yeah. This is actually before OSC, and OSC, you know, they made a lot of noise about how cool OSC was, and everyone started using OSC, but this is actually much better. Okay. Because uh, because it doesn't have structure, and so OSC the thing is they threw all this structure into the thing and then they realized that they were too structured so they added more structure in, this, in OSC too, <laughs> and in order to get around the limitations of the structure they put on which in fact were the limitations that they should have just taken off. But yeah. What's the source sound? Is it? What's the oh, so that's sine wave? I mean, what's the actual oh sound? How, what's the sound itself? Well, yeah, so, so imagine the thing moving around in the interior of a box, and then take the cosine of each of the things, and that gives you three sounds. And, and those are derived from, so those are so so wave. waveform sounds right. generated at that time. Yeah, yeah right. So the X, Y, Z are the phase, the sort of drive system. Those are the phases of the three. And then you take couple the cosine phases. of them. Take the cosine of them so yeah. that they would be just so three sinusoids. Sine it's kind of like a cosine table that's being read in a noisy way. That you don't. That's a good way of describing it. Yeah. Or sine wave oscillator. Rather than going around in a nice cycle, it's sometimes jumping in the okay. And then I cheated a little bit because I realized that you could, or you, you don't want the thing to, to have discontinuities because that gives you uncontrollable high frequency or controlled with, you know, fold overable high frequencies. So cosine is good and safe that way, but sometimes the, the, there aren't enough partials. And so then what I did is I took it and made the cosine have a plateau in the middle. So if you imagine a cosine doing this, it's also called a hum window, right? Actually, it's not, because I didn't give it DC. It does that, right? But you can also make it go up and then sit there and then go down. And that gives you a, essentially kind of a cheap pulse width mod that is still decently controlled in terms of fold over. But at any rate, you can, just, you can actually just listen to the raw coordinates, too, if you want, with just the three things without using any wavetable at all. And the result is just yeah, a little harsh. <laughs> Other questions about this? Yeah. Could you say a little more about the musical considerations and, um, like, to use your earlier analogy, how did you decide where to put the one holes in the shoebox and where they would go to? Yeah. Like, how did you think about this noisy meeting? I thought about it pretty hard actually, and did a lot of did a lot of, of more complicated things before I found the simplest thing. So I, basically what I try to do is hack it down to the simplest thing that would, that would work, which is still too complicated to understand. But the, the thing I did was I started with the, two, uh, with the two weights whacking against each other. And then if you think about that, each of those weights can be thought of as, as moving through all of its phases, essentially. So as the weight just goes through that, you can talk about the phase of that. It's going from just beginning to end and wrapping. So then two uh, two two masses on springs that weren't coupled then would be moving in two dimensions and each one would just be moving uniformly so you would just get a path that would move like a, like the thing in asteroids. Um, in other words, it would, it would move on a, tor on a torus. It would, move, it would just move along the screen and then wrap around. 
then what you do is you say, well, what's the locus of shapes where the thing is actually whacking each other? And the answer is not, but the answer is approximately uh, an edge, sorry, a, a diagonal edge here where, the, where both of the phases are, are close enough to close enough to, e to either end that they're actually overlapping and therefore you're not allowed to be there. So there's a triangle at the bottom of the square and a triangle at the top of the square that you're not supposed to be in because that would be the balls actually occupying the same space. And then what the fa and then what happens is the balls bounce off each other, which means each one of them skips the last part of its cycle and just jumps ahead to to the part of the cycle where it's the same place but moving in the other direction. Which in modular sin is soft sync. You can do that in modular sense where some some oscillators will have just a phase flip when it hits. Oh really? And that's what soft sync is. I've never yeah. known. Okay. It's, it's just amazing the, the nasty stuff you can do with that. Right. Okay. And so and so what that led me to was okay. There's a shape down here and a shape up there, and then we will whenever we hit the shape up there, if we're if we're moving this direction, if, whenever we hit the shape up there, we just jump to the opposite point instantaneously, keep going. But then I simplified it to okay. Let's just take a rectangle out of the middle, so that we don't have to think about things at the edges because it's harder to think about. And then you have a square or a rectangle in the middle where any time it hits one of the points on one side of the rectangle, it just jumps instantaneously to its exact mirror image. And then if you're using cosine functions, the, the values are the same on either side, and therefore you don't get a discontinuity in the waveform. And then I decided two oscillators is great, but how about three? And so I did that whole thing in three dimensions, which means there's a shoebox shape in the middle that's, that's taken out. And and then you can, uh, the interesting things to control are the three frequencies, which is just how fast it moves in the three directions, and how large that box in the middle is. If you make it just vanish, then the thing just oscillates freely and you get three tones. And if you make it occupy the whole thing, then the thing gets stuck. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it, 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 it oscillates very fast because there's no, no, no room for it to move in freely because it's always jumping. <laughs> and then something in between, you just get all manner of weird semi-stable behaviors. I'm using the, the leap motion as well, mm -hmm. with processing and, and sending visual data yeah. into Max. I wonder if you had gone the other way, have you sent any of this kind of information into a visual process or as a visual artist? Uh, I have. Um, and I can't say that I can't say that I've been really terribly successful yet, but what I've been trying to do is working in um, spherical projection spaces yeah. and, and painting in space essentially by having um, same same physical setup, but pretending that your hand is a paintbrush with your middle finger emitting vaporous paint in, the, in, in, in space. And then the shape of your hand would be controlling the, the, the shape of the brush and the color of the paint or something like that. And then you, you and then you're sort of, you can spray paint around in, in space. And then you can think also about if you manage to, to well, to store that trace, you have to store it anyway in order to be able to render it. So then you can actually have the paint drift away or fade out, or whatever, right? So I think there's a lot to do there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just beginning to, to mess with it right now. Mm -hmm. One last yeah. question. Um, One question, it might not be the last. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. Uh, so the, um, you talked about the slowness, and then you talked about the theatricality of that parameter. Yeah, right. But you could, have you tried multiple type of mapping? Same question as last, as on Tuesday, but different context, yeah. where this would be a kind of slower parameter, right? Uh, and this would be more immediate. So I have a precise pitch and register, for instance. Right. I haven't tried that. No. And well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do register and pitch because I'm thinking of the ear double, double double perception of pitch. You know, the chroma and, and tone. Oh, I see. Know? So this kind of range versus. Oh, I see. So you would. Well, that's interesting. So you would, so here you would just sort of crossfade across octaves, something like that. But not change the chroma in the end. Exactly, here exactly. Just here. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Man, I would collect those. We should do like a uh, canoe and send like uh, pockets, you know, credits when we give you a good idea. Right. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. mm -hmm. yeah. You know, canoe with is like if you find the. Oh, the, if you find the, the bug and it's the book. Yeah, exactly. Type one in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there was a mathematician joke, right? Yeah. Um, or you could imagine other 
reverb mix size of space mm -hmm. maybe yeah you know, there's a million things that, that could, could be slower mm -hmm. yeah right in that parameter and then you keep your delta mm -hmm. control here which I presume is what you do you probably if it becomes your triangles but I still don't understand yeah, how you, you you can I mean, move it anywhere you want to, and it doesn't change the, the values, theoretically. I'm not really sure that's true, but <laughs> but theoretically, if I'm holding a, a steady shape, you should see that Fs and the Zs roughly constant. Okay. Yeah, it's not bad. And then if I move something like my thumb, you can see F3 and Z3. Yeah, I thought about that. Is, is it um, oh, yeah. One thing I've never been able to do well is set. What am I saying? Uh, it, it, is have one level of control that changes how another level of controls is is, is yeah. mapped or is, is interpreted. That's a sort of a natural thing to to ask for. Yeah. And I've set myself up with situations like that and never been able to play it practically. So. Try it, but I'm not sure you will like it. <laughs> but the other thing is, um, well, two things. One is there's a huge difference between this kind of gesture and this kind of gesture, right? Uh, just theatrically. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is uh, just cognitive load. Uh, I, my cognitive load. I don't know if I could actually do something meaningful with two hands simultaneously. There's just too much going on. I, I guess so. If I, I'm going to try it, but to keep it really simple, so maybe like. Close of a fist, or or maybe just even making the left hand present would change would change a, a scene or a yeah. setting that kind of thing. And I actually have an unspoken fear, or I'll speak it so it's not unspoken. It might be that the thing gets slower when you have two yeah, hands. Yeah, so too. <laughs> and even just having that flat momentary thought was enough to persuade me not to do it. Check <laughs> out. <laughs> Amy Oliver's project called Mano, um, oh. which is based on it's two video cameras and he does his own analysis, but it's exactly the same kind of thing, skeleton yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like a black, he just has a black um, desk, which is not actually an instrument, it's just to provide contrast. And then some lamps, and then a camera that comes in from the side and a camera that comes in from the top. Yeah. And plays it and there's some performances yeah. online. Just to mm -hmm. see what someone's done with it, you know. Yeah. Cool. Give his hand mapping. Yeah. And he does some of that where the hand seems to right. That's Jaime Oliver La Rosa. He works at NYU. He was a student of mine, and in fact I saw all that work and that it was a strong influence on this, I should yeah. say. Um, he uh, to get that to work he used a Sony gaming camera that runs at 200 frames a second. So don't use these 30 frames a second cheapo cameras if you're going to do that. Um, and I think his stuff is also open source. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, he's... Okay. And PD. Mm -hmm. And is, what's the, 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 the commercial thing that people who do like uh, gesture analysis, like all the Kermit people who do like piano, pianist analysis, which is much faster again than, than real-time camera. Oh, oh the real-time, yeah. yeah. 30 frames a second, and they yeah. do pianist analysis, piano gesture analysis. And they also do uh, eye tracking. There are people at like McGill yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and in the University of Montreal, Kevin and Tobin. They also do like eye tracking. Seth, yeah. so Seth, was, Seth was using. Seth was using some of that stuff yeah. uh, with uh, Marcelo Vanderly yeah. and others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and and but they, do, they start also to do eye tracking because that's another high bandwidth controller. Okay. Yeah, I the eyes don't know how fast very, eyes very, very quick. Yeah. Okay. And there, there was some video today showing uh, professional versus learning pianist. Uh -huh. what they look at, what they perform, oh, okay. and checking patterns of where you look at when you perform. And that needs to be very, very quick, obviously. And professional pianists have got foresight, foresight roughly. <laughs> They're looking much broader and much further ahead in the music uh -huh. on the piano than the amateur. You know the Russians were doing electromechanical systems to that in that 1901. <laughs> probably not at 200 frames a second. No, no, but they were. They <laughs> yes. were all right, probably I mean, the sound in Zip was amazing. Right. It's probably infinitely fast. It could be an extensive solenoid. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe I should. Is this code? Is this code available? Is it like hidden like, code, or is it? Uh, it's not ready yet, so it's not out. But okay. um, 
So eventually I'll actually I haven't figured out how to publish stuff like this. It's more the later I'm interested to control my modular synths with Yeah. I, I do lots of chaotic systems with modular synths and this is, could be a good source of control. Yeah, yeah, and you can use the oscillator of course without this and in fact I yeah, that's what I'm interested in the oscillator more than the, the yeah, controller. The controller. Yeah, um, it's just a case of when you hit, you, you jump. And then sorry? continue from that point. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's not. But it's, it's, yeah, but that was, it took yeah. some work to get it working. I was about yeah. to say, I trust Miller's implementation more than mine, especially if I don't try it. Yeah. 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 No, if it's not available, I'll try myself. But oh, no, I could just email it to you. Oh, so that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just not, it's not documented or anything like that. It's not in your book yet. No. <laughs> and in fact, I have to rethink that because really, you know, when you get into applications like this, it's more like, here's a thing, but don't do it this way. Learn from this and do something better. Right? And mm. I don't know precisely how to present that as a, you know, as a thing, but I'm, I'm thinking about just having a website just with inquisitions or something like that, we, each of which is just sort of, eh, here's a thing. Uh, You've, got a paper. Something. You've got a paper like this which I've uh, implemented, the uh, furiously unknown oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. resonator, right. uh -huh. which is, I think these kind of speculative codes are very interesting to see. Yeah. Because that's exactly. another one that is interesting to make, um, to make very strange spaces. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no Colin says it's Aaron synthesis. Oh. Have you seen that? No. Aaron synthesis? I think that's what he calls it. And basically, he just applies all these geometry things, and he's like, "What if we thought this was an oscillator rather than a shape?" <laughs> and then we just, you know, play it through a deck. Yeah. You know, on that subject, I, since doing this, I thought of something that sounds even simpler, which is just just imagine a triangle, not a square, not a rectangle anymore, but a triangle. And now imagine just a billiard ball moving around in a two-dimensional space where you just controlled the, say, the three lengths of the sides of the triangle. That already would be an interesting aperiodic oscillator, and it would be easy to well, not easy because the thing is, you got to you got to work, you have to work to figure out the path which edge is it going to hit first. You have to actually go compute that, and you have to compute exactly when it's going to hit the edge to subsample accuracy, because when you make it rebound just like a phaser, you want to keep the overshoot that is a subsample overshoot and add that to the rebound. Otherwise, you'll get fold over. So um, you'll still get folded, but otherwise you get worse folded. Right? So uh, yeah, so just imagine billiard balls bouncing around in polyhedron three dimensions. Say that would be an interesting space of, of possible oscillatory behaviors to try. What, what I would struggle there, if we stay in that mind space, is how do you define what is a phase in that respect? Mm -hmm. How do you define? The, the boundaries of your plus minus one of your oscillator, let's put it like this, when yeah. we fold it back into the reality of a DAC. So there you, you give up on the idea of just jumping from one edge to the other, yes. and you just bounce off it. So at that point, any continuous function of the interior is good. Yes, but you, you still have two dimensions in the interior. If yeah. You stick. Oh, yeah. And then what we represent as sound if, except if you map it to a complex sine wave, I presume, and then you No, the dimensions back. here are reading different oscillators. Well, yeah, but they're, they're uncoupled, so x is just one. Phase. Yes, I know, but I'm interested in the idea yeah. of a single ball as a single oscillator. Okay. If you have three parameters, you're changing your triangle, right. or or you can you can actually play the three lengths of your triangle, or two lengths actually. The third one will be declining. But uh, well, no, it'll only be different. Or, or the angle. I mean, there, it, an angle. There's an inequality they have to obey. Exactly. Other, that's cool. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. But, but if you have two, two lengths and one angle, mm -hmm. it would give oh. you a variable triangle. Yes, that would be a good As a cool controller, right. like, mm -hmm. okay? And, mm -hmm. But the ball position is your oscillator. Yes. Now, since there are two degrees of freedom, Thank you. you could take two independent functions. Yes. And all, all you would need is for those functions to be continuously differentiable and have a zero gradient at the edge. And then you would be happy. Okay. Oh, the zero value and zero gradient at the edge. But then have two of them, and then you have a coordinate system on I mean, it's differential geometry. Just any coordinates are just functions of the space. Mm -hmm. And so just and if in three dimensions, just make three independent functions, and whatever they are. And what they are will affect how it sounds, but at least the fact that they're different from each other means that you'll have something that, that reflects the entire position in whatever the space you're in. And why three? Just because two isn't enough and four is too many. I know. <laughs> And that's a, that's judgment. That's not 
There's no, there's no factual basis for any of this. Yeah. Anyway, this is all on the side. <laughs> Which we can continue on if you want, but or we could start talking about, or I could start talking about, or you could start objecting to my talking about um, problems in trying to represent scores in, in computers, which is another thing that bothers me. Um, okay, yeah, so I'll just move on to that. Um, let's see, so I'm going to close this out. Yeah. Um, maybe after, the, um, after we shut everything down, if you're curious and would like to, I can... I just do... Okay, we're good. Um, I can set this back up if anyone wants to play it later. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and annoying at the same time, just an interesting space to explore.